I'm Trina Green Brown. I am the creator of Parenting for Liberation, and I describe my parenting identity as um, being a mother of two children, one biological and one as a bonus child that was given to me by marriage. Mm-hmm. Um, and I parent them, co-parent them with my partner in Los Angeles, California. And um, the project that I created is really about is really rooted in their liberation. So like, what can I do to be the best parent that's most liberated and uninhibited so that they can also be free, whole, carefree black children in a day and age where that's not what their Mm -hmm. life is set up to be by the world. So that's what I'm up to over here in Southern California. What about (laughs) y'all? Hey, Trina. (laughs) Hey. Um, I'm Ignacio Rivera. I'm Mandy Rivera, or Amanda. And we do um, our online talk show called Pure Love, or Pure Love Talks, if you're looking for it on YouTube. And uh, you want to say a little bit about it? Well, um, it basically is about, um, like, an just interactive, continuing dialogue between parents and their children, or guardians, and, you know, however other words you want to use for, you know, that dynamic, um, about sex, sexual education, um, just everything that it entails to combat, prevent, um, stop, uh, eliminate child Mm -hmm. sexual abuse. Yeah. Yeah. So we do our show to kind of share, story tell the good, the bad, the ugly on, you know, what it is to be a parent and talk about these really hard topics and but really like push the envelope and actually talking about it and then like dissecting what is sex education. Yes. And I love that y'all do it together, like a little dynamic duo over there. Um, yeah, I totally need this conversation because I'm just going to admit, I have not, although I'm parenting for liberation, I have not been the most liberated when it comes to talking about sexuality. Not that I've been super conservative. It's just like, Mm -hmm. if I don't talk about it, we won't talk about it, which is probably the worst thing, right? Which I know is the worst thing. Um, And and I'll just also admit, like, I've been doing work in gender-based violence for the longest, right? Like, my most of my career, even from when I was carrying my child in in, in utero, I was working in gender-based violence. So I was like, I'm supposed to know how to do this. And then now that I have a child, I'm like, I don't know how to do this. (laughs) So he's nine. She's 14. I I know like the 14 year old, I'm like, I'm like, I'm just praying that her mom is talking to her about this. Um, Because I'm like, is that my place to talk about this with her? Do I talk about it with her? Like the cool stepmom. But for my son, I can't just assume that his dad is doing it. Like, I need to get on my game. So thank you. I need your help. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and I would say, you know, like a lot of people uh, down themselves and get really, you know, hard on themselves when they don't do it or they say they didn't do it right. And really, you know, everybody does it in their own way. What I'm trying to push is that we're actually having the conversation. No matter if we fumble, we might not know all of the stuff, but just making it normal. You know, just making it normal. I feel like like um, having these conversations is almost like when your child or teenager or whatever is actually experiencing, it's like almost the same. Like you have no idea what's going on or what's going to happen or how is it going to be, who is it going to be with, but, you know, you just figure it out as you go along, you make mistakes and you grow and you learn what not to do, who not to, you know, deal with, what your boundaries are. I feel like that's the same thing with, talking to your kids about sex too because there's never a a right time except all the time right (laughs) Right. i feel like like as a co-parent you know it is you know your place to discuss these things if you're a family you know it shouldn't just be like well biologically you know you belong to them so you have that conversation it should be 
the both of you, as well as, you know, the other parent, you know, yeah. the biological parent of your daughter, and yeah. as well as talking to the father of your son to see if you guys can collaborate or if he has said anything, what information has he given, yeah. you know, so you can maybe piggyback off of that or see where you need to fill in the gaps. Cause sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, men leave a lot to the imagination. <laughs> so, you know, it's, I feel like it's better to be it. <laughs> yes. I feel like not necessarily like a binary view, but just like, you know, you have a female perspective, you have a male perspective, and then you have like, a step parent perspective or an older sister perspective, you know, like I feel like all that will encompass and come together mm -hmm. and make it a, a broader education mm -hmm. for your son and for your stepdaughter as well. Yeah. It's yeah. Like the, what I say, like the community based like model of like sexuality education. Cause we, it, we see it as such a private thing, you know? And, right. and of course I think in some aspects, yes, sex and sexuality is a private thing, but it is also a very, very public thing. And we don't acknowledge that it's super public because it's everywhere. We're right? sexualized right. from the right. beginning. And yeah. now we're in a world now where, I mean, everything is at our fingertips on our phone on, you know, right. so the information is out there. It's there. <laughs> so, um, social media too. Yeah. So everyone has a say in our sex and sexuality and it is shaped by what we see and all that. So because it's all around us, it is that community base. And it's really hard like that, that, um, that line, right. If you're a co-parent or if you're the step parent, do you have a conversation with the other parent and say, Hey, since your child spends some time with me, what would you like for me to share with them? Or what have you talked mm -hmm. about? And that, and that, those are hard conversations because one, you don't know, people have different styles of talking. Um, there might be, uh, you know, some, um, some issues there that's really tough they you know be religious or cultural barriers between yeah. like what kind of information you want to give too yeah. so it's a tough it's a tough thing it's a it, i think you constantly have to be working with it you know? i think a, a you should an icebreaker you know like i would suggest just not i mean like kind of bringing it up but not as a it's a one conversation thing because i feel like that adds a lot of pressure to the both of you Cause you're both like, oh my God, we're building up to this conversation. Oh my God. It's like when you get that text message, like we need to talk and you're like, shit, I'm in trouble. <laughs> so it's better. What did I do? Yeah, you're, just, you're going through your mind. Like, what did I do? How did I, like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, what did I do? But it's better to make it like, you know, not, it's more than once. It's mm -hmm. all the time in different aspects or cause you can talk about relationships or actual sex or masturbation or sexual violence or, you know, all these things come up. You might see a movie together and it might bring up something. They might see something on social media that could spark something. Even if you just ask about their day, like you can find something to kind of like latch onto to turn it into a, an opening for that. Or just let them know, like, you know, if you want to talk, I'm here. You know, it could be about mm -hmm. anything. And then once the conversation starts, you can open more doors to more things. Mm -hmm. You know, that's really helpful because <clears throat> when I hear y'all talk about how to talk about sex and sexuality, it's like, that's the way that I've been talking to them about racism, right? Mm. Like it's not a one-time thing. It shows up in a movie or it happens mm -hmm. in a book or, you know, inequality. And I spent all this time talking about like racial equity and fighting for justice. And so I spent, and th those are hard conversations too. Yeah. And I still push myself to have them and figure out the right language. And yeah, things come up on social media where like someone is shot. So then I'm like, this teenager already knows before I can tell her. So let me talk to her about it. So, so all of that happens and I still feel like able to step into those conversations. And so I really appreciate y'all naming the ways um, that I can step in and not shy away from the conversations. And I'll just like a name growing up in a super, I wouldn't say we we're super religious, but like I became super religious more so than my parents at one point, but growing up in that, in that culture, like a super um, Christian culture, it was like taboo to talk about anything beyond abstinence, right? Like you were just supposed to be a virgin and that was just it. And like, you didn't need to know nothing about your own biology, your own sexuality or intimacy. Um, none of that was supposed to be happening. And so I'm not raising my children with that frame, but because I don't have, this is not an excuse, right? But like, I don't have examples of how to have the conversation. 
well, now I do, <laughs> <laughs> right? Like learning how to do it. I was like, dang, did you document this process when Mandy was younger? Because like, mm -hmm. I want to see videos of like, how did you talk about that? <laughs> I mean, it was, it, it, it's nice to talk about this now as she is an adult, uh, you know, an adult woman now. <laughs> and what, what actually like happened as we were doing it, like we, I brought it up constantly throughout her entire life some moments she was easy to talk to about it other moments she was like oh my god that's so gross why are you talking to me about that it's disgusting you know <laughs> but i kept i kept it moving i kept on talking about it. i kept on bringing it up and one day <laughs> i remember she said something like verbatim uh, how i used to tell her and i was like oh shit, she is listening because yeah. yeah. <laughs> i thought She's not listening because I'm giving her condoms and dental dams and talking about, you know, asking her if she's, if she's heterosexual or queer or this. And she's like, oh my God, could you just like <laughs> leave me alone? <laughs> and I was like, I'm going to keep talking to you. Guys. And then it was, then it, it kind of all was there. Like everything was filed away. And so everything that I was saying wasn't being lost. No. It was actually being stored and used and really her friends ended up like going to her. Like she was the go-to to ask about certain a things. A lot of the peer, things. Educator. <laughs> the peer educator. Yes, even before I was sexually active, my friends were asking me for, about stuff and I'm like, <laughs> I haven't done anything. I'm like, I just know a lot. Like, but I know. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, but I do know this. Like even now, like I have friends, like a lot of the times it's my male friends that I have mm -hmm. to teach about female anatomy a lot and it drives me crazy. <laughs> Um, cause they, they believe all these myths and I'm like, we, if we had sex ed in school, like real mm -hmm. sex ed, that yeah. would eliminate a lot. And if the parents were doing it at home too, that would eliminate the other half of it. Cause mm -hmm. I'm just like, I have a friend who's 20, 22, 23 and thinks that if a woman is on top, she can't get pregnant because of gravity. And I'm just like, <laughs> what, <laughs> what? But I'm like, I hope that you are not in that I situation. I hope that is not your birth control method. Yeah, right. I hope that's not it. But right. <laughs> and I, I'm giggling, but I shouldn't even laugh because it's real. Like they really believe it. It's real, and it's also, um, uh, you know, it's about. It, there's so many reasons why we get this misinformation. It's fear. It's 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 misogyny. It's you know, like there's there's so much stuff that goes into the misinformation of our own bodies, and you know, and what how our bodies work about desire about love you know we we literally have a cookie cutter model for everyone and that is you look for someone well first of all it's a heterosexual model and right. then it, you find someone you date for a little while you're in love you get married you have children right and then the the rules even within that how you're not supposed to have friends of the opposite sex and and this is what it means to love someone you know, if the you're forever. a real woman, you're like this. If you're a real man, you do this. Right. And it's like the forever thing. There's so many. And none of, I think those by themselves as the only, you know, thing doesn't work. If it's in the context of the, this is one of many ways that this could happen, then it's a different conversation we're having. So it, it really like broadens the, the idea of what, sex is and and really when i say sex i've said this a million times it's just like it's not just insertion we're not talking about insertion and pregnancy impossible sti that's like the limited version of it right it's like penetration it's period so much more like so much more when, when i think about how kids form friendships when when children are able to create their own boundaries to say, no, I don't like that. Or I would like to do this. And no, I don't want to do that. That's, that's sex education. That's, that's building the blocks for consent in the mm -hmm. future right? that they have a strong understanding of their own personal space and to trust their gut when something feels wrong because children feel it. They have that gut instinct and they don't trust it a lot of the times. Um, and it, cause it's not backed up by information uh, or it's, um, it's catapulted by fear. Right. So, mm -hmm. so it's about, and I like what you say, you know, you say you want to raise your child, you know, in this way that, that, that eliminates the fear. Right. And when we're talking about race and class, but it's also the same around sex and sexuality. This it's completely fear-based. Everything is scary about 
And yeah, there are some scary things. There are. But there are some beautiful and wonderful things there too that we should know about. Yeah. yeah. I remember um, earlier, Mandy, you were saying that the information is out there and the conversation need to be had. And I was telling Ignacio before that um, I realized that my son had a definition of sex because I kept saying sexism. So here I am teaching this like right. lofty concept around sexism and equality because, you know, I always get into my theoretical, like <laughs> it's equal between the genders. What are you talking about? Um, that's misogyny. And then I keep saying sexism. Right. And he's like, why do you keep saying that word? Ew. And I was like, sexism? <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, yeah, but if you don't say the ism, you're saying that word. And I was like, that word? I was like, how do you know what that word is? What does that word mean? And he's like, I don't want to talk about this with you. <laughs> <laughs> Ignacio, as you were describing, talking to Mandy about it, I sometimes like, ew, I don't want to talk to you about yeah. it. And I just like kept going and digging. And then I found myself in some place with him learning that he learned about it from his fellow third grader. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, how does this third grader describe it? And right. it was it was super heteronormative and it was all about like sex, but not anything else outside of it. It was about two people laying in a bed, right? Mm -hmm. And it was a husband and a wife or a girlfriend and a boyfriend. So it was still within the, the frame. Right. Um, <clears throat> and I was just like, Okay, that is your definition of sex. And then I had no other definition. Well, I had other definitions, but I just felt so stuck. Like, okay, I guess I'll let you sit there with that definition for now. But I feel like it's time for me to like reapproach and be like, so I remember we were talking about sex, and I know he's going to be like, eh, no. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like I got to re engage um, and move beyond that like limited binary idea of what sex is and also expand sex to beyond penetration to sexuality mm -hmm. um so i need tools from y'all about how to like reapproach the conversation yes yes i mean i i've i've said this um um several times on different um blogs or um podcasts that these these are some of the things that i used um that were really simple but were really really um great and there was on one of them was on the um the zine that just came out for survivors right so it's a kind of skill share for survivors um that was put out by gather together in baltimore and um so one is so some people say i'm so nervous about talking about sex and sometimes my child doesn't want to talk about it so one way that i used to do it uh with mandy was like a sex education by proxy right and so for me that meant uh, that I was, you know how when you hang out at the house and you're talking with your girlfriend or other adults, right? And your kids are kind of hanging around and you know they're listening, right? <laughs> they're just like, they the are, they are, right? And they are just For waiting. some reason, I think my son might literally tune us out, though. <laughs> <laughs> he might he might be like they talking well if you do have a child that listen <laughs> then this listening. might work that this might work this might work so for the teen <laughs> it's um conversation by proxy so you would have a conversation with your friend about whatever topic it is about sex about a thing that happened um anything that you think that directly talking to them will make them feel embarrassed and you would give your point of view, your whatever things that come up for you. You kind of talk about it really, indirectly, kind of right, and and wholly with this person. They're listening to how you react, how you um, understand something to be, how uh, what's important to you. They get it in that way, so they're listening, but you're not really talking to them directly. I'm gonna just um, have a fake cell phone conversation one day. Yes, exactly. Yeah, they wouldn't exactly. know. Exactly. <laughs> I'm gonna be in the car on the way to work, off. on the way to school, and be like, right. make sure it's on vibrate or silent though, because then you'll get embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh. <laughs> I'm like, oh, what? We had a disconnection. <laughs> Yeah. Um, another, um, way that I, uh, one thing that I did with her, um, was the, um, uh, no repercussions day, <laughs> no repercussions day was a day that we would go to a cafe and sit and just like get tea and snacks and things. And it was an opportunity for her to ask me or tell me 
anything she wanted to at all and she could confess to anything and she would not have any repercussions for that so but i could ask follow-up questions and we could go back and forth and discuss it right because one thing with uh young people a lot of times they're scared they're totally terrified to bring something up and you could you could actually pick the category right so it's like jeopardy type you know like what's the category the category is sex or the category is race and class the category whatever the category is so within that framework um what what do you want to talk about anything at all you can't get in trouble and i could do the same so we go back and forth on that that worked really nicely because she would say things that I, you know, and I was like, wow, if I wouldn't have done that, she probably would have never brought that up. Right. Mm. Um, That's also bring them super liberated for that because you know, you promise no repercussions and you'd be like, Oh my goodness. I cannot believe you did that. Yeah, is this and a trap? You gotta hold to your word. <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing. It, it's actually showing them too, that they can trust you. Right. They, that what you're saying, your word is your bond. Like if you say you are not going to get in trouble, you're not going to get in trouble and you don't have, and if you don't have to process it, you know, you can set up the, the parameters the way you would like, and y'all can come up with those parameters together. Mm -hmm. That also shows good boundary setting and negotiation. You're negotiating what it could look like and then do it. And then you say, you know, you could easily say, wow, that was a big one. Okay, let me let me digest that. But as I said, no repercussions. Okay, so let me answer it. And then you just move past it and go on. And that is really helpful. Um, and one of the things I, I, I often say to folks too is, and I did this before with her, I would say not to uh, put all your hopes in telling your children, you know, if you have anything you want to talk to me about, you can come talk to me, not to put all your eggs in that basket. Because I think some people would say to their kids, I'm, I always left the door open. I always told them they could come talk to me. But it's really, the, it is putting it all on them to right. actually have the courage to come to you and say something. So, I mean, it's okay to say that, but that I don't think it's something to rely on. I think right. as parents, as guardians and parents and all that, it is our job. We have to... We have to push through it, even when they say, leave me the hell alone. You're going to keep talking about it <laughs> so because, because right. it, is the, it is a life skill. It is an absolute life skill that um, permeates throughout our entire lives. You know, like how we talk to people, how we form friendships, the relationships we have, how we, um, how we have sex. If we have sex, if we even like sex, they too. Right. So it is, there's a lot of different ways to think about it because I doubt that any parent, oh, I shouldn't say that. Let me take that back. I doubt that many parents um, think about sex education and bring up asexuality with their children. No. I don't think so. Um, because that is a topic of sex. You it, know? I feel like our society is so sex driven that we can't even imagine a person not wanting it at all it's mm -hmm. just like that wasn't even like a lot of people that's not even an option like even in schools like it was a while before i even heard about what asexual was and what it meant i didn't even know that was a, like a thing oh not a thing but i didn't know that people were like that mm -hmm. so i'm like if imagine if people knew that when they were younger and what if they like discovered that that was them mm -hmm. like how do you talk to your kid about that or like how do you have these conversations with them when they're not even sure of their own sexuality yet or them their own bodies if they've even explored their own bodies things like that so that also goes into it yeah i also think um storytelling uh, a lot of parents don't like to do this a lot of parents i think in terms of sometimes we don't share things because it gives us leverage with our children and so i often talk about power dynamic as a parent as parents, we have power over our children. And a lot, of, a lot of times we use that power, right? We use that power all the time. And so sometimes we don't want to share. Um, and, and sharing often humanizes us uh, and makes us vulnerable. And I think the big thing, we have to make ourselves vulnerable. So our, if we want our kids to open up and talk to us about the thing that they're going to do for the first time, the first kiss, sex, talking about, you know, 
um, you know, um, pregnancy prevention or STIs, relationships, um, you know, queerness, polyamory, monogamy, kink, kink all of these things, um, we, we have to give a little too, you know, because for most parents, we're like, um, it's like uh, this little fantasy thing. We don't really know much about it. You just kind of see it or you don't. <laughs> and that's it. Right. And that's why most people think of when they think of their parents as sexual beings, it's like, oh, my God, gross. Ew. Yeah. Like, you don't want to think about your parents having sex. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be thinking that head, huh? <laughs> There's not enough therapy in the world. <laughs> Wait, see, you told you just said that we're supposed to share with our kids. Mandy, like, mm -mm, no, I mean, you, you can share, but that's the visual aspect. It's like, I don't, need it. <laughs> I don't know how else to share without telling the story. <laughs> Let's just take just a, a little less adjectives. <laughs> a little less adjectives. <laughs> Not so descriptive. <laughs> yes. I mean, for one example for me uh, was uh, I shared with her about my relationships, uh, what I was going through when I was sad, when things were going good, and really when things went bad. Like, I cried to her. I would cry to her and tell her, this person hurt my feelings or I'm hurt or they're an asshole or the, you know, whatever it was, she really got to engage with me ab about my relationships, like what I was struggling with. And we were talking back and forth about it, you know, and she comforted me and she saw that I was a real person. Yeah. <laughs> and actually like, it made me feel like a sense of pride and made me feel good. Like, wow, like my mom is talking to me about stuff. Like you're asking <laughs> me for advice. Like, and you're listening to me. <laughs> like, that's it. That was, that's a big thing. Cause I know a lot of parents like, well, I don't know personally a lot of parents, but I know a few of my friends dealing with their mm -hmm. parents, they weren't allowed to like get an access to a personal story. And on top of that, give an opinion mm -hmm. yeah, and not be like, girl folks business. Yeah, it's exactly grown Get folks. Out of grown folks conversation. Yes, yes. Yeah. So but, um, I mean, I think that's really important. And like, just to play devil's advocate, like I've also heard people say, like, I've been in different parent workshops, and it's like, um, people say, like, don't burden your child with your problems. Don't burden your child with your, mm -hmm. I don't know, troubles. And but hearing you describe it, it actually created a way for connection and bonding, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to share. And like, I'm like, how do people figure out that balance? Like, I don't know if we're supposed to be superhuman or superheroes to our kids and never have problems, which I feel like is unrealistic. Um, yeah. So just hearing you give this example, I'm like, yes, I'm all for it. And then I remember in other workshops where people are like, you know, you need to figure out your own way to heal and don't bring your pain to your kid because it's too much for them to handle. And I was like, what? Huh? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I think it really does depend, right? Because every child is not the same, right? And so there is never going to be a cookie cutter model to, to raise our children, right? So if we can take some of those advice, you know, and then we put in what works for us. So a lot of people ask me, what is age appropriate? What is age appropriate, right? And so there are lots of books that say from age two to this, from six to the, you know, they and, and different books say different things. And I try, I don't, I don't um, concentrate too much on really getting specific about, okay, at age two, you do this, at age six, you do this, because if, the point of the, my work at the Heal Project and through Pure Love, my work um, basically is about the relationship that we have with our children. Mm. If we are forming the relationship with our children, we kind of get a sense of what they can and cannot handle, right? Mm -hmm. uh, most likely. Not all the time, most likely. And we're also human people. We fuck <laughs> up. It's okay. Right. And okay. I, it, okay. it's okay. It's totally okay. It's okay if we realize it and we fix it and we move on, right? Because that, that whole thing about being, you know, superhuman, uh, sometimes we, we make ourselves sick um, uh, with that, you know? So it's like we, we can have a relationship with our children. We can figure what is good to tell them, what is not. Um, and people get bogged down by, you know, they say, well, you, you talk about kink, you know, I'm not talking to my six-year-old about kink. And I'm like, 
No, you wouldn't. Under the <laughs> layers to it, and there's still lessons in right. teaching about kink, like consent and boundaries exactly. and communication. Right. And there's still things age appropriate that you can pull out of that conversation, right? For your child, I love that? the piece about the relationships. Oh, I'm sorry, what are you talking, Mandy? No, I was just gonna say, like, I work with children, so I try to find little ways to teach them about consent and things too, because I'm like, mm. we are the rape culture is ridiculous. So I like I try to teach them about consent in ways like if they get upset because a, sh a kid is not sharing a toy with them or something, I go up to them and I'm like, okay, like what's going on? Why are you crying? Like what's going on? And they're like, well, she didn't want to give me her toy, and then I'm just like, well, that's okay. Let's her toy, so she has the choice whether to say yes or no. So you can ask her, and then she can give you an answer. And you may not like that answer, but you can't do anything about that because that belongs to her. So that's her choice to make. So like little by little, I give them lessons like that. And then they'll be like, oh, okay. So I'm like, so go ask and mm -hmm. see what they say. Because I'm not going to tell her to give you her toy because that's her toy. That's her choice to make. So mm -hmm. you can ask her. And then when you get her answer, then we move on from there. So I try to do that with them, like just little, little things like that, because they may not realize it now, but later on, maybe another situation might arise and they'll be like, wait, let me make sure that's okay before I do that. So mm -hmm. if you do that, then I mean, that's great right there. Thinking before you act on something could save somebody's life. Mm. Yeah. And it also helps that, you know, in the example you gave the, the little girl, right, um, be able to use her voice and like make choices about her body or her objects are what belongs to her in ways that I can hear that same story playing out where I can hear someone telling the little girl like oh you should share be nice and mm -hmm. all of that like the like you said the rape culture is so real in our in our culture um mm -hmm. that it even is like playing out in young children's relationships around boundaries and consent um so yeah I know that y'all do this project and it's explicitly about ending or preventing um sexual violence, um, what, what inspired y'all to make the connection between healthy sexuality and talking to young people and your children about it and preventing sexual violence? Mm, uh, well, it started with the, the fellowship that I have now that uh, helped me to be able to create the HEAL Project. So the HEAL Project uh, stands for Hidden Encounters, Altered Lives. And it was a fellowship uh, um, for specifically around um, interrogating, ending, you know, um, uh, child sexual abuse. So they wanted people to give um, innovative ideas on how this could happen. And so we had eight fellows of color uh, and uh, or eight survivors of color who are now fellows and then 10 organizations already doing the work um, and they got funding as well. And so my the platform that I thought about because I have been doing radical sex education and doing my work has just been immersed in sex, sex and gender, sex and gender on a, a variety of different ways. And I think one of the reasons why it's been that way, because it's been my journey as a survivor, it has been my journey in trying to find my own connection to my own body, my own desire, what that meant. And for so many years, how messed up that was mm -hmm. and how I almost screwed this child up when I had her um, because I was so in the beginning of my, um, my healing uh, from in, in my survivorship. So in, in my own work and, and also talking to other survivors and asking the questions about um, just talking to them, sex comes up a lot, which is interesting because when we talk about sex education or we think about rape culture, sexual violence, children are completely eliminated from that conversation. Mm -hmm. So children are left out of sex education and they're left out of the big work that has been getting done for a long time around you know, sexual violence or anti-sexual violence against women, girls, people in general, right? And so how can we, how can we even discuss rape culture or how can we even discuss sexual violence if children are not a part of that? And so the link for me is uh, um, sex or the abstinence of the sex conversations. Because even when we talk about rape culture, we only talk about it or rape, we only talk about it in the context of, it is not about sex, it is about power and control. 
And I believe, yes, it is about power and control. And yes, it is about sex. To take sex away from it, uh, really, it, it really just, uh, it really does a disservice and harm because sex is the very thing that it's is- It's the a, violent it, act. It's the violent act. And it's the thing that is completely altered in survivors' lives. Our sex, yeah. <laughs> our sex is completely altered, right? Whether we're hypersexual, we don't have sex at all, we're terrified of it, of relationships, all of it. And there is a clear connection between being a survivor of CSA, child sexual abuse, and being a survivor of domestic violence and rape as an adult. So right. there's the link right there. And so we need to be talking about that because if, if, if we go to conferences and you know, um, and organizations doing work on that front, there has to be work being done on the other end as well. There has to be. Um, and so that's why through that project, um, I wanted to do that. But as people were asking, you know, like, so how do we do it? How do we, you know, are you going to write a book and this and that? And so uh, I don't know. I'm still thinking about the book. I know I'm going to be doing a toolkit. Uh, nice. But in the interim, as I'm trying to figure out what the toolkit is going to look like, I was like, storytelling. This is this is what people of color do. This is in our DNA. Storytelling, right? right? Let's storytell about how we did it, like how the the good stuff and the crappy stuff, because we need to show people that they're human. It's okay. This is a really touchy subject, but it is one of it is super super important to have these conversations yes i agree and i'm gonna do it i promise <laughs> <laughs> i mean i'm already doing it but i'm gonna do it with much more intentionality mm -hmm. um and i have some tools or tips to do it in a way that's more cre like that is creative you know with the like fake phone conversation i'm gonna have on like <laughs> <laughs> and um yeah because in the car yes I know that he listens because he. I'll hang up a phone call and he'll be like, "Mom, why are we talking to so and so about so and so?" And I'm like, "Why are you in my business?" <laughs> but it's like that's the time. It's like there's no other things that he could pay attention to because we're in the car, right? He's captain. Um, so I will totally apply some of those. And then you have this. You don't have your book yet or your toolkit yet, but you do have this. Um, uh, chapter I would say in the zine um, mm -hmm. and so we can totally share that and I'm gonna take some of those tips and I think Mandy said some of them too so I can tell that they're like living breathing tips they're not just like made up right um, y'all have practiced them they're tried and true and mm -hmm. I think I heard you say too Ignacio that you know there is no cookie cutter so I think it is going to be kind of hard to write a book <laughs> you know um, because you like once it's written in word people are like will worship the written word and you're like wait but it's not a cookie cutter way so that's um, why it's you know think thinking about what what what, what am i gonna how am i gonna convey this information what, what's the tool kit gonna look like because yeah it's always changing and i constantly say like as we say that gender is fluid and sexual orientation is fluid this is fluid it's always changing and evolving. So we have to be of the time and just really engaging with it constantly, you know? And I would always say to ask your kids questions constantly, how kids ask us questions. Sometimes we don't even have to say anything. We could prompt the conversation. For instance, I, uh, one way is uh, movies. Love it. Go watch a movie. Almost all movies have a thing about, relationships even cartoons you know <laughs> ask questions what do you think about that what do you think about how they did this and just keep asking keep asking as you get a sense of where your kid's head is at right from from all the media that they consume right. so what did how does that translate to my child and get that information once you have that information you could continue asking leading questions um and navigating them to look at other things. Oh, did you, can you think about it this way? What about this way? What about mm -hmm. that person? Question after question is great because it's really making them think, 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 think. 
And believe me, especially with your teenagers, she'll just love to talk about her opinion. So she'll just talk and talk. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure your son too. A lot of the times, if you just wind them up, you just let them go and they'll just, you don't even have to do too much because they'll just be like, oh, mm -hmm. I've been waiting to talk to you or I didn't realize that I wanted to talk to you this bad. Mm -hmm. And so you have that conversation and they're like, wow, I want to keep doing this and I want to keep asking questions. So right. it might just take that one conversation about something random and connect it to something else and then that'll just... It'll go off from there. Something about cars or trains, I'll have to figure it yeah. out. <laughs> about his favorite movie with him and see what mm -hmm. aspects of it you can bring up. Um, or like be like, oh, if you were in that situation, what would you do? How would you handle that? Or like, mm -hmm. what did you not like about that? Or how did that make you feel? Things like that. Think like those are open questions where it's not just a yes, no. So they'll ha you'll okay. have to get more information from them and then you can form an opinion about, you know, how you uh, like uh, attack this large, mm. large topic. Yeah. And I just had an idea about what would be a good tool that y'all could create. Mm -hmm. It's like a card deck. Oh, like, this is one of the ideas. <laughs> I'm like, where you just like pull these cards. Cause like, just as you're saying yeah. all the questions, I'm like, go watch a movie and here's 10 cards for the movie or the fake phone conversation. Here's 10 <laughs> cards to pull. Right. Um, <laughs> because I'm just like, I need to write down the questions real quick. <laughs> right? But yeah, I'm like, that's an idea. Make a card deck or something. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, I'll say it over and over and over. It's uh, from birth to crossing over. That's what I always say. Mm. Birth to crossing over. You're con I'm, we're still talking. We were just having a conversation about, you know, re new relationships, you know, um, yesterday. <laughs> so just because I'm like, you know, you got to tell me who you're dating. I'm like, what's their name, blood type, where they live? <laughs> I need to know right. that. Right. right. So we're talking about that because it's real. Like, and those conversations, like you talk about, you know, um, you know, talking with your son about race and uh you know i read where you said your your internalized oppression which when, is you huge. know when your kids you know black kids talk about wanting to be white and you know tackling that conversation with your children it's the same with sex education right because i often say there is no way um i could have talked to my child about sex education without talking about race colorism fat phobia you know, patriarchy, mm -hmm. there's no, th it's not a conversation if I'm not talking about that, because all I'm doing is painting a pretty picture. I need to tell her. Oh, and, I, and I know that some people say we can't scare our children. It's not about scaring. And I don't say anything to scare her. And I don't dump all of this on her. But we are talking constantly about what it is. For my child, when she was, in, you know, going to a school where she was one of two black children in her grade, Right. So all the all the little boys, right, were white boys, and that conversation about her crushing on white little boys and what they saw when they looked at her, and you know, so that well, added to that myself. conversation. Yeah, yeah, that added to a whole bunch of internalized everything because I'm just like right. I'm too fat, I'm too black, I'm too tall, I'm too loud, I'm too poor, I'm too this, like I'm right. too opinionated, I'm too all these things that made me a scary black woman for them, but for somebody else it wasn't scary. Right. So, you know, but you have to let them know, like, don't think that your environment right now dictates who you are. Right. Yes, that sounds like my son and my daughter's school. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm always like, I'm starting to think about that. Like, oh, when they start, if they already are, they might have already like start crushing on people. I'm like, what is that dynamic going to be like? Um I'm like, it ain't a lot of options of people of color to choose from. So mm -hmm. your options are limited. So like you're going to like somebody <laughs> or maybe not, but just like that. So that does help me think about like there is racialized dynamics that would probably because of the way that we talk now or like actually be a good entry point. Mm -hmm. And then we can go deeper into um, the sexuality because right now he's just so used to me talking about race. <laughs> I mean, it's very, very important. I mean, especially him being a black male in this country. Oh, yeah. You know, he's a target on him 24 7. Right. That's scary and that's, it angers me. So, you know, yeah. he has a lot on his plate too, yeah. on top of dealing with consent and sex and everything else. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, this has been really helpful.
Mm -hmm. well, well, I had one question for you. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh -oh. <laughs> I wanted to ask you. I'm in the hot seat. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you because um, you have parenting for liberation. So I wanted to ask you, what do you, uh, how do you identify liberation? Oh, that, that has been the question of this whole project. Mm. And I'm like, I don't even have a definition, but because um, I feel like there is no one, like you said, there's no right. cookie cutter. Like right. liberation looks different for every person. Um, but I see it as twofold. Like it's a destination and a way of being. So like mm. we're trying to get to this place of liberation where all children, black children are treated equally and fairly or not equally, equitably um, right. and have access and don't have that target on their backs and that they can walk freely without fear. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to get to that place. And then liberation is also a way of being because like we have to practice it every day. So in the way that we live and the way that we raise our children and the way that I talk to him and them yes. and the way that I nurture them and the conversations that I have, like it has to be from a place of liberation. I can't be fear based mm -hmm. in the way that I talk to them about anything, yeah. including sex and sexuality. And so it's, it's this twofold way of being and also the destination that we're trying to get to. So that's how I hold I it. it. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so this is a new this is my new call to action in terms of like um i i feel like i'm i would say i'm liberated when talking about sex and sexuality i just gotta actually start talking about it mm. <laughs> it's easy to be liberated when you ain't talking about it now i gotta be about no. it and talk about it <laughs> so appreciate this and i will follow up with y'all and let y'all know how it goes i'm, I'm gonna ask you I'll if i do the if the luck. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> what did you say, Mandy? I'm sorry. I'm giving you all the luck because I know you got two like, prepubescent and pubescent children. So <laughs> that's a difficult time period. So Is it? Oh, no. I should have did it earlier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one years old. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, it's going to be good, though. It'll be a good learning and growing and bonding experience for the three of you, the four or five of you, all the yeah. parents involved. All parents. That's yeah. the part. That's the work right there. You work with the dream work. Same work. <laughs> I know. Look at y'all two over there. Dynamic duo over there. I was like, I got to figure out how to get my kids involved in the podcast. Yeah. I've done it once. That could be a great way to break the ice. Yeah. Talk to them about the podcast and get their opinions and say like, oh, let's do a little project together. You want to be on camera with me? Do you mm. want to do an interview? That might get your son excited. <laughs> it worked for you? Yeah. <laughs> nice. I feel famous now. You are. You are. Talk about YouTube and YouTube <laughs> celebrities and Instagram celebrities. You could be like, well, you could be my YouTube co celebrity mm -hmm. if we do this right. project together. That, that might actually be a good seller. I might, have, I might be able to use that one. You know, we are close to Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. I see good. All right. I'm going to try that. We'll see. <laughs> All right. And I need y'all to hold me accountable. Um, because that's also the part, right? Is to have accountability, you buddies, to um, it takes a village check in with us. Yeah, yes. appreciate y'all taking this time. I really enjoyed talking to y'all, and I learned so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, y'all. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. Good luck. <laughs>